In our last two sessions, we are going to drill into changing the nature of market visits. The last group, talking about punching above your weight, started to hit on this idea of what can you do in market as, and what power do you have as a supplier to drive attention, garner more than your fair share of focus from the distributor, and start to impact beyond that distributor relationship. How do you affect that trade relationship? How do you impact the end consumer? Um, so we're gonna, we have um, three guests up with us. Um, we are going to uh, spend the next 45 minutes talking with Juliana, Jim, and Jeff about really the nuts and bolts of what market visits look like today in terms of best practices and what you all as suppliers have the power to do because this is really it's it's a you know travel expense budget but it's your time it's your manpower of you and your team getting out into the marketplace so um, as a reminder we have Slido uh, you guys have done such an awesome job getting your questions up um, and I'm trying to sort of keep track of all the questions and answer them in somewhat semblance of an order here um, but before we intro, uh, before we intro the guests, I want to just do. I think there was a quick survey um, that we wanted to issue. How many of you guys have done market visits in, um, or how many market visits have you done in the last twelve months? You personally. Okay. Great. Good. So you guys are getting out there. Wow. <laughs> Diane, of course you've done 36. All right, great. So, so this is really about how you begin to, to amplify those visits. And, and as the team, the group up here just before break talked about how you make the most of that limited time that you have, right? You're spending the money to fly across country. Make sure that it's worth your while. And there's lots of mechanisms you can, you can employ. So without further ado, um, I want to, can we jump back to the introduction slide? Um, I want to introduce our speakers. We had Jeff because we're so pleased to have distributor representation here today. We brought Jeff back. Um, Jeff has, in our initial conversations, he just provided a wealth of information on what distributors look for and hope for from suppliers when they come into the market, and what's helpful and what's not. So he's going to provide some inside tips on that, that I, I frankly, I learned a ton. I've been in a market so many times I can hardly see straight, but I learned some things that I thought I was doing right that, frankly, I could, could be doing better. Um, Ju um, uh, Juliana Colangelo is um, the owner of um, West Coast Director of Colangelo & Partners, successful, prominent PR agency that has connections coast to coast. She. Um, does uh, public relations for a slew of wine brands, and you work outside the wine industry as well. Spirits and food. Spirits and food. And um, she has secured placements, um, the likes of Chicago Tribune, uh, National TV, for a number of brands. But more importantly, the reason that we brought her to this session um, is because she doesn't think just like a PR. Um, Firm. She isn't just about media placements, and she isn't just about wine ratings and scores and press releases. She thinks about what you can do to really punch above your weight and make great utilization of limited budget. Um, and as we started to talk about market visits, she provided some really great insights and ideas about how you can take the, the media-facing side of your business and the consumer-facing and trade-facing sides of your business and pull them into the market visit experience so that you get more out of it. Um, and then lastly, we have Jim Sweeney here, um, Director of Sales and Marketing for Humboldt Distillery. Jim has, comes with a really unique background in that he has worked extensively in three-tier and DTC. Um, he's uh, run national sales leadership for brands like Constellation, Huneus, so he's worked, on the, he's worked for the big boys. Um, but he's also worked on the distributor side as well. And now with Humboldt Distilling, he has uh, launched and is in development or growth phase of a cannabis-infused vodka. He understands brand building at a really high level and, um, and I think has a tremendous amount of insight in terms of both sides, what suppliers uh, need and what distributors need to, to really win in the marketplace. So without further ado, um, I want to jump ahead. Um, I think we decided we weren't going to do slides for you guys, right? So these guys did put together slides, which we are going to include in the PDF version. Um, 
And what I asked them to do is similar to one of the earlier sessions, um, is top three tips of, of most important sort of best practices uh, in a market visit. So Jeff, can we start with you since sure. you're our voice of, voice of the distributor? Yeah, so um, I think it's, it's an interesting thing. In my career, I've probably gotten more phone calls from upset suppliers on work lists than any other topic, um, whether it's a big supplier, medium supplier, or a small supplier. Uh, your person didn't have the wines chilled. They didn't have pricing. They had no appointments. So I had to go pick up checks with them. I had to, anything's happened to any of you? Any of you? Does that happen to any of you? We have once, twice, twice. Um, we didn't show up. Um, so so it, it's interesting. It, it happens to all tiers of, of, uh, of folks. And you know, I, I always kind of boil it down to the root cause is that probably there wasn't good communication from the outset. Um, and I, I think in some ways, you know, the days when I started in this industry of I met, met a supplier at 9 a.m. and we'd have a cup of coffee or what have you, we'd talk, and then we'd go see 8, 10, 12 stores, and then 6 o'clock the day would be over. Those days are over. I, I think I, I don't see many of those kind of work was happening anymore. And I think in our mind, we still think those work was happen. And I think it's a waste of your time to spend 8 to 10 hours with one of our salespeople. Um, because they have other things to do, right? They've got to pick up checks. For some reason, we're still in an industry where people still pick up checks. American Express has never come to my house yet. I'm still waiting, but we still pick up checks. Um, you know, they got to get orders from their companies. They've got to punch orders and all the administrative stuff, and that doesn't have to do with selling. Um, you know, so I would say before you jump on a plane or get in your car, you know, understand what you really want to get out of that, that market visit. And then I'll, I'll frame this up with the last thing. I think the beer business does such a great job with their market reps, um, where I think wine and spirits does not. Um, and, and how they do that is they really track their people. They track them through whether it's Salesforce or Lilypad or different type of um, CRM uh, uh, um, apps to see what they did. And these apps are really useful because you have your people and you can see where they've been and how they've been there. I think that's such a, a miss in wine and spirits. You have these valuable resources, your people that are in the streets, and there's very little follow-up as to what happens. And I think in the beer industry, they really do a nice job of brand building and utilizing these street people as their brand builders. Great. Can you share your three tips, Juliana? Sure. So as I was listening to the earlier sessions, a lot of the things that uh, apply to working with distributor or apply to working with media as well. Be prepared. Have a story know what you're going to say, say something specific and interesting about your brand. Don't just go out and ask for an interview because you're a winemaker, but have something specific to say. Um, and also, again, plan ahead really well in advance for these market visits. So we work with our clients often on filling out market visits. So they'll let us know they're going to be in a city like New York or Chicago or L.A., um, and we ask for at least four to six weeks notice so that we can then do all of those things, create the target media list, who do we want to reach out to, create the pitch strategy, what's the story, are they launching a new brand, um, have they just come out with a new strategy or something related to a topical issue like sustainability, um, or do they just have a really you know, important story to say about their legacy and their history that we're going to craft. So it's so about going in with the strategy, being prepared, um, and being really specific as well and, and what you want to get out of it. Do you want to focus on business media and try to target that consumer audience? Or is your brand about lifestyle and do you want to uh, reach out to some lifestyle publications and influencers? So again, be specific about what you want and be specific about you know, what you're trying to say as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Juliana. And, and uh, before Jim jumps in here, I just want to add, you know, I've we talked a lot about the idea of advanced planning, and we're gonna spend a little bit more time around sort of what that looks like, what happens actually on the ride with when you do have one, and then what happens after. Um, but just the fact of, uh, both of you all have hit on this idea of, it, it, it's a lot of advanced planning, right? In terms of length of time and the amount of work you need to do to, to make the most of it. And just an anecdote, um, in the course of this preparation, I, I spoke with um, a fairly high level distributor um, executive who, who said, um, you know, it's, it's quite interesting the number of calls I get that um, start with, I want to come in market next week, still. And 
Um, and it gets even better. I mean, she went on to say, um, you know, the, the, the kinds of questions asked, um, where would you recommend I fly into? And um, who should I book a car through? What hotel should I stay at? And do you have any babysitters? Because I'm bringing my family. <laughs> Right? Imagine how that makes a distributor feel. Every one of those questions I've got. I got one three weeks ago. It's not a good feeling, right? Because you're not a travel agent. <laughs> so, so I think that that, that advanced planning and really understanding what realistic expectations are um, is, is a key foundation. Um, so let's come back to that. Jim, can you share your thoughts on sort of key tips? Uh, yeah, please. Um, a, a number of us have been in the business for a long time, and the changing nature of a market visit is just incredible. And so to your point earlier about what people have asked when they come into the market, having been a distributor and a supplier for some time, uh, that research, I know I'm going to South Carolina in late August, early September. I'm working on that trip right now. And so in this situation, what happens is I thought that Charlie said it so well at the, at the end of this last uh, session, and that is those four categories. So if you have sales, trade, consumer, and press. Yeah. And if you just, you know, I, I left the room and went and laid it out. And I've been on the road a million days. And it's really interesting. As you go through those, the first and foremost thing is with regard to the sales. And somebody over here has already done 36 market visits. If you think about the time on the road, whether it's, you know, a market visit could be 5 to 10% of your field time. If you're running a winery and running other types of things. So if you think about that effort. You know, your T&E budgets, I mean, maybe you've lined up and, and in one of the earlier conversations about COGS with, with Michael and what that S stands for, but your T&E budget, I mean, if it's twenty dollars or $25,000 a year, you're going to burn 10% of your budget, really, going to a market by the time you play it all the way through. And then finally, specifically, how many names do you want? How many cases do you need to sell? But really, to go through each of these quadrants, with regard to trade, the number one thing that I was going to recommend is... Once you've established who you're going to see, and ideally one of the most popular questions is, who should I go see? But you can really figure that out if you're using Google, your phone, and your Yelp. But the idea is, and it's something that you see from, you know, whether it's Salesforce and LinkedIn and Lilypad and so on, ABM, account brand management and account brand marketing. If you're not doing research on who you're going to call, speaking their language, ideally having the presentation for them, if it's in written form, branded with them, if you haven't signed up for their newsletter eight to 12 weeks in advance, so you know they do Wednesday night tastings, you know that they have a wine education class, kind of shame on you. So when you go, and we've heard it all day, is that um, it was beaten to me when I was a baby, and that is you're not selling to, you're selling through. And a buyer doesn't want to buy anymore. The shelf space is you know, the same, essentially. Cans are coming out. Cocktails are cool. All of this space is encroached on rosé is now 30% of everybody's set. And so now what are you going to do to sell through? And that research is completely found online. And then when it comes to, um, with regard to the other thing I want to bring up, somebody brought it up, is regional accounts. When you're in a market, do not be afraid of going to a regional buyer's office, ideally calling ahead. They're, they're essentially never kind of rude. They won't have time for you. But to drop a presentation or to say hello and leave two bottles, when, if you met P.F. Chang's, when P.F. Chang's was one or two placements, Mary is still with you on the list. You know, if you met Houston's group, Rutherford Grill, when they were babies, you're on the list. Who would be aware of Food Fight in Madison, Wisconsin? Hold on, because they're going places. And so those regional accounts that will return your call or at least come to the lobby and say hello, don't forget to make those calls. The next one, just real quickly, is consumers, interacting with consumers. Somebody had mentioned it earlier. I like to call it because I'm lucky enough to know Dennis, but it's called the cake bread effect. And so cake bread couldn't be a bigger brand, right? Dennis spends 100 to 150 days on the road with his customers. And so whether you're fly fishing in Alaska or whether he's doing an in-home dinner, whatever the case is, and they're at the winery every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, they're still building a brand. And so what kind of consumer events can you have? One, think about an in-market release party. If you can't get a distributor's attention, at least send your 50 cases to UPS. They'll sign for it. For $5 a case, you can bring it to a country club or someplace and do an in-market release party. You can do call on wine schools and see if you could be the, speech, uh, the featured speaker for the evening. Culinary schools, you know those folks love food and wine and want to meet the cake bread effect. Who are you? You know, everybody believes that we have the best lifestyle on the planet, right? Everybody wants to be us because we live in the wine country. 
nobody realizes this kind of sucks, right? <laughs> and so, you know, and, and I used to live in Houston and so moved over to the dark side, right? And so in Houston, I'm from a large family. I never had one guest. We had babies, they were cute, nobody ever came. Then, you, then we all live out here and every friend comes from nowhere. Um, and, then, and then the other side is, don't forget your alumni associations, depending on you know, how large your school is or other things that you might belong to. Alumni associations, they'll gather, and then business clubs often have wine tastings. And then, um, and then with regard to press, is that if you empathize with regard to what press is going through, there are so many forms of, uh, of information that one, if you get a good score, the problem is if you get it, you still have to scream it. Remember just 10 or 20 years ago, if you opened The Spectator, everything over a, an 89, if it was a Best Buy, and a 91, it just, you just picked up the phone and you took orders. Well, those days are over. But what's happened is press is in the same situation. True story. Uh, I, I, I just want to put it in perspective. I was the sales manager of Constellation. So when I went to a market visit, I, you know, it, it kind of went well. But, but now, I'm, <laughs> now I'm a distillery, and I, I, one, I don't know why I did it, but it's a bottle business. And so this is the hardest thing I've ever done. So when we talk about market visits, you've got to figure it out. Sorry, I'm going so long. No, but, right. So I, I had to call the, the Dallas Morning News and see if I could get a piece, right? And so fortunately, they returned the call. And as we were talking about each other's business, they said, you want to be in a hard business? You get in the print copy business right now. That's, that's less fun than we're having. So uh, they invited me to their office. And what happened was I learned that the Dallas Morning News, and in doing research, a lot of other papers are doing this now, is subscriptions, right? So we're reading an article from a paper, and about 30 seconds later it says, for two bucks you can join us and become a subscriber, and we all bail, right? But what the Dallas Morning News does now is it's a membership. And so for 3 to $5 a month, what they do is not only do you get the paper, but they have events and they have very interesting symposiums and they have tastings. So with the Dallas Morning News, I'm now going to be tasting with their tasting club. So I'll be a featured kind of guest. And it's not about me, is that if you empathize with these problems in the press and PR, you can really get things done. And then the final thing, now I'm in five, but the final thing is follow-up. And so your market visit is only as your, your, your follow-up. And, and I was trying to cite kind of the, the first impression I had, and that was a long time ago as a rep in Houston, I was working with Janet Pagano, who was the winemaker at Mountain Vitor a thousand years ago. Now she's a rock star, makes Ovid and everything else. And I remember she was in my car and we're going to accounts, and after she, each account, she got out a letterhead of Mount Vitor and wrote the thank you note on the way to the next account. So as a distributor, I was like, she's got her shit together and we're gonna go anywhere she wants. And now what happens is with our technology, you can send a note mm -hmm. for a lot of you to yourself to remind you to send the shirt. You can send a note exactly to the account on your next drive, but sit in your car and do that right away. Once again, it's only as good as your follow-up. So if you say to somebody, I'm gonna send you a free T-shirt, send yourself a note, or if you have an operation where you can send that sample, do it. But once again, your market visit is only as good as your follow-up, and it could be 10 or 20% of your time in your T&E. You can't afford not to. Awesome, thank you guys. This is a great um, sort of opening salvo here. What I'd like to do is um, jump back to you. We, we, covered, um, we covered a real great breadth of topics and I wanna start digging into, into them more deeply. Um, so we have sort of, can we jump to the Slido, sorry. Um, so we have this sort of, per, the proverbial milk run question um, up at the top there. So how do, you, uh, how do you make the most of your visit um, so that it's not just your distributor dragging you around, sorry, close your ears, Jeff, dragging you around to courtesy tastings or accounts just to, that just yeah. like to taste? Yeah, so I think, um, I think it goes back to, again, what are the expectations? So um, if you're just happy because you got to work with on June 14th, that's probably what you're going to get, right? Um, hey, I'll just show up and I'll just go get in the, the salesperson's car. Um, I, I, I think identifying what those markets are, I, I think, you know, I mentioned before that the days of spending 8 to 12 account calls, probably not the best use of anyone's time. Um, I think it's probably getting on the phone with that rep in advance and saying, hey, I went through your territory. I saw here's three accounts I want to see. And I'll cut you loose. We'll meet at 10, buy you lunch, done at 1.30. I just want to see these three buyers. Can we, can we see these three buyers? I think if you take the time to identify their territory, I think you can avoid a lot of those things. Um, and also, I think, you know, kind of what we talked about a few minutes ago, 
really high spot in those ter- their territory in advance. Maybe you sit down with your business manager, again, beginning of the year. Hey, I've been very frustrated with my work list. It's not the, it's not the, the people, the people are great. It's where I'm being taken. Can, can you maybe show me your top brands in this price, or top accounts in this price point? Hey, there's 50 accounts in this price point. I'm a $50 Cabernet. Here's where, my, here's where I play, highest velocity in this area. The next time I'm in the market, can I go see five of these? Or, hey, here's an idea. The next time you're in the market, can you give me the name of these people? I'll go see them. And, and truly, particularly if you're a smaller brand, your time's probably better spent doing that. You need the information, you need the target list, you need the target mapping of where the right people are. But sometimes it's, you're just as effective to go there yourself, have those conversations, and then you really want to win that salesperson's friendship because the next time, the, the ideal scenario is that while you're making that pitch, they're making a pitch across town for you because they know that you help them build their business. So, so let's drill down on this yeah. just a little bit. So, um, so you started us sort of with the, the initial call, sort of know what market you want to go to, know what yeah. your expectations are. How do you even get hooked up with the, the right rep, right? So you, you're presumably not talking, yeah. you're not dialing reps, um, but rather you're getting handed over, your request for a market visit is getting handed down to somebody. Yeah. How do you influence that and sort of find your way to the person that might potentially become a brand ambassador for you? So I'm, I'm laughing because I spent 10 years in, uh, in New York City managing the on-premise there and uh, for a large distributor. And we had reps that, many, many reps that made well over half a million dollars. Um, and they had admins that worked for them, literally. Um, so they had a, it's a different kind of business model for them, right? Uh, they called on the big nightclubs and things like that. These people truly had influence. Um, and part of how you got their attention is helping them, helping them run their business, show them where the opportunities are. Um, every single wholesaler has a, a big writer, has a, has a salesperson who, who does an inordinate amount of business and dominates his or her accounts. Um, they know that already. Right? They, they know how to run their business. That's why they are where they are. They didn't run and go into management or anything like that because they wanted to be a salesperson and they've mastered that craft. Um, but really understand what value you can provide to them is extremely helpful. The question that was up there about the milk run and tastings, that's adding no value to them. You're not helping them. Um, but how you add value is go make those placements in their accounts to help them and they become your ambassadors. That's for the whales. For the other reps, let's say a wholesaler has 20, 20 salespeople. If you could find advocates for those two people how do you do that? Every key has a different lock, right? It could be, it could be hey, education. Uh, it could be providing samples. It could be um, explaining your brand ethic. It could be a friendship. It could be spending that time with a cup of coffee. Sometimes going to see those accounts, spending eight hours with someone isn't necessary. Sometimes it's, hey, let's meet. Let me walk you through your portfolio. We have a cup of coffee. And you go about your day. Those little touches, they help. I think the thank you cards... I couldn't tell you how many suppliers I get those from, and it makes a difference. Honestly, from my, in my mind, I go, well, you went from, like, number 112, you're now at 75. Just that. <laughs> and it, it is a simple little touch, but it means something. I mean, no different than when you have dinner with a friend, and they send you a thank you card afterwards. It's simple, but people appreciate it. It's a people business. It still is. Great. Thank you. That's that's very helpful. Um, can can you all talk a little bit about um, the development of in market relationships and sort of how what you can do, particularly at a at a trade level? Um, I, I've sort of heard the uh, several folks allude to the idea that sort of the expectation now or the hope is that suppliers can a- actually build those relationships with trade partners and go make that sale in essence. Or how does that work and I mean, the distributor's still taking the order, but is, is that a real, to what degree is that a real thing and a real hope and expectation, and, and how much weight does that, does that lend in terms of um, uh, positive impression with the distributor? May Jim, you can, you can take a pass at that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when we think about kind of the, uh, building the relationships with the buyers and how do you permeate that, you know, we've heard it earlier and we all live it. So look at that number in Arizona, which I find shocking that there's 113 distributors in Arizona. I can't get one to perform for me. And uh, I'm only kidding. And, um, and you know, there's 100,000 new brands, you know, every year, if, if not more. And then we also know that the driving force in retail and on a premise, you know, for those that are kind of more in value price brands is private labels. 
Private labels are now 25% of our industry. That's crazy. In an industry that's only up two, three, or 4% in tonnage, or I mean in cases, somebody's getting killed, right? And, um, but anyway, so to develop these relationships, I'm gonna come back to one or two things, there's a point, and that is, if you sign up for their newsletters and react or respond to those. So if somebody says, you know, with, with Paul Hobbs earlier, if somebody says, I'm doing a Pinot Noir tasting, you could phone them and say, hey, I can't make it, but I could, can I either, you know, webinar in, or can I do this, or can I do that? Suppliers, all we're accused of doing is asking for the order. But if you can at least be aware of their marketing plan or be aware of what they're doing or be aware of their forwarding any articles in LinkedIn, but be able to relate those top, let's say, 50 in the country or five or 10 in a market, you know, it's, it's, actually, it's actually manageable if you can do it. The second one is, is that I was getting earlier about wine country visits. I continue to be a little bit surprised how few distributor sales representatives, and not in a negative way, don't ask if the buyer's coming to the wine country sometime this year. And if you've been a wholesaler, what happens is once that on-premise or retail operator says, I'm going to the wine country, what can you do for me? The person who reacts and responds first gets the trip. So somebody may say, I want to go to Paul Hobbs or Cake Bread, but you can fill in the rest is that that's where you, once they get here, it is personal. And they may be coming, coming with their family or they might be doing this and that. So two examples, one almost cost me my marriage. I actually invited a buyer to stay with us in our home and they said yes. And so <laughs> that's off limits. But then the other side is, <laughs> <laughs> so my wife was conveniently out of town that weekend. And, um, <laughs> and then the second one is, is that keeping in mind this distillery is, is, I'm not painting it, but it's hard. And so there was a major retail buyer from Texas coming uh, to Napa Valley, and it's hard for me to make an impression. I could try to leave a 50 ml on their bed at their hotel or at their cottage, you know, whatever winery they're staying with, or leave a t-shirt, or give them a pass to go have a cocktail at Farmstead or whatever the case is. But in, in cahoots with the distributor, what we did, and it only cost me about 100 bucks because this person's a friend of mine, is that we made arrangements knowing which winery cottage they were staying at that a mixologist knocked on their door at 7.45 in the morning because everybody's first appointment is at 10. So either you're going to go to, I, I don't even want to reference my neighborhood, but you go to like a bakery and, and then you go to a winery. So everybody kind of generally has breakfast available. And a mixologist, a totally cool mixologist, walked in, knocked on the door, everybody was in cahoots, including one person in the group of eight, with her tub, and went in and just started making Bloody Marys. Didn't say anything, just kind of walked into the kitchen and started shaking it up. They're done. And so between the samples, she came awesome. in, she had eight t-shirts, <laughs> made cocktails, she's a hoot, gone by 8.30, my program's done. And, and this would have been one where you just can't see this buyer. And so these are the types of things to try to be as clever as possible. Yeah. You're not gonna permeate them in the Tuesday tasting lineup between one and four with 113 distributors with 100 brands and, and there's no more shelf space. So Great. anyway. Really helpful. Um, I would add just using social media as well to connect with those buyers and follow them, comment on their, their pictures, connect with them. I think we see our clients uh, that do the best in market is the ones that make their own efforts outside of the market visit. Stay connected, use social media. There's all these tools now that uh, you should be present on and be active on. Don't just have a page, but actually use it. Follow the people that you want to know your brand as well. Great. Julia, uh, Juliana, I have another question for you as it relates to building trade partner relationships. Um, do the same rules apply for, for media? I mean, local media, how hard is it to get a foot in the door? And what, do you, what, do you, what tips do you give to small suppliers to just get that face-to-face -face meeting, that dust side. Yeah, a lot of the same principles do apply, building the relationship, knowing who they are as a person. Um, so we can really tell when we put a winemaker in front of a journalist and they've actually read that media bio we sent them a week in advance of their meeting. And then do they take you know five or 10 minutes to actually find out who this person is and what they like to write about and a few of their recent articles. And if you can reference those things in that meeting, it shows a lot of respect to the writer. Um, I also would say, uh, be cognizant of the changing nature of media, which Jim touched on. I mean, newspapers are folding all the time, and wine columnists are getting cut. I mean, just this year, I think two or three alone have been cut, including the Chicago Tribune's um, wine columnist. So there's fewer and fewer writers in each market. So unless you're in New York, San Francisco, Chicago, when you're in those smaller markets, there's maybe 
like a couple dedicated wine writers. Yeah. So think more creatively. Uh, maybe you decide you're going to have an in, a, find a group of social media influencers to tap into and, and host a tasting with them. Uh, we're doing something with a client for World Bike Day. Their brand is bike related, and we're doing a uh, Soul Cycle class and inviting media and influencers to come and have a Soul Cycle class and a wine tasting. And that's in New York where there's a concentration of media, and you can do that. So I would think about those things as well. If you're going to be in a market like New York with where, where there is a lot of media, consider building on a couple extra days. But don't expect to have five interviews in Savannah, Georgia or some small market. It's just not going to happen, and you know, you're going to be disappointed. So also consider the volume of media that's present in each of the markets you're visiting when you're planning your schedule. Great. Um, I'd love anybody to, to comment on this. Um, there's a question up here about you know, doing the market visits and then having sort of that sinking feeling when you leave that you, like, you become this distant memory within hours. Um, so let's talk a little bit about sort of post-market visit. Um, what, what things really stand out? I love the example of the thank you note. But what else, what else comes to mind maybe that you guys have seen um, personal examples of or have done yourselves that have garnered sort of an ongoing conversation with that? with that rep um, or with that account that keeps the keeps the momentum I think I think the first the first thing that ha has to be done is some sort of a agreed upon follow-up plan you know mm -hmm. before you before you before you leave that vehicle or what have you hey, you know I'm gonna follow up with Joe's you're gonna follow up with Jane's um, and then detail that out and I think I think one thing that I, I see misses a lot is people don't involve the manager I think there's this feeling like hey I work with a salesperson I'm gonna get I'm gonna get her in trouble because I'm including their manager. Again, it's a follow-up. We want our people to be just as accountable for their time as you do. So if they spent four appointments with you and you made four presentations, we'd like all four to get sold. We truly want that. I mean, we had our employees sitting there with you. We could have had them sit with another product. So I think that's key. Who owns that? Um, and it, it's on our, our people just as much, but I don't think if you establish that ownership um, and that accountability, it's never going to happen. And I think this is the other piece that I think a lot of suppliers do as well. I'm a bother, so I won't send that second email to ask, hey, what happened? So your point is, I spent 10% of my T&E on this day. I'm going to be a little bit of a, a nudge on this. Hey, what happened? And then the third thing is, did you reach out to the account as well? Hey, just give me some feedback. You really tended to enjoy the, uh, enjoy the Sauvignon Blanc we tasted. Um, did it with, not fit your price point. Did something else come along? Just, I just, I want to get feedback so I can go back and kind of uh, understand what happened next. So I think those are kind of three things I think that are really important with a follow up. Um, and I don't, I don't think, I don't think you have this have this fear that hey, I'm being a nudge. I think everyone understands that you flew across the country to come see someone in Milwaukee. They get it. They know it costs money. It's not free, um, and it happens. I, I, I think those are pretty important stuff. I would say with media follow-ups key as well, unless it's a radio interview, that article's not coming out you know, while you're sitting there with the writer. It's taking them weeks or sometimes months to put the article together, get all the facts, so follow up with them. Um, if you have an agency, I mean, that's what we do, but if you're doing it yourself, make sure that you have that reminder to check in with the writer and ask about that story and that article. Provide them with assets. Hey, here's some photos. Would you like to resample any of the wines? Oh, we just came out with this new thing. You know, keep them informed of what you're doing, and then maybe even after that article hits, continue to follow up, stay on their radar, send them news when you have it. Don't just check in without anything to say, though. You know, have something relevant that you think might be interesting to them. Uh, the only thing I'd like to add, and that is, is that if you have a relationship with your distributor, I mean, clearly if you've gone in for a work with you do. And then the second one is often when we do brand planning, so what is the quarterly goal or the annual goal and what is the incentive, is have accounts presented to. So it's actually kind of a chapter in that. And um, once again, it's also a very graceful way to get it into your reviews. But once again, if you just put the list of accounts that you've called on, it just organically comes up in that review. So just it's sometimes just very easy. Instead of saying, did anyone follow up on my work with? You've got the eight accounts, possibly the commitment, and it's just a little tag on it. That's great. Um, can you talk? Can you all talk a little bit about your experience, um, and in particular, you, Jeff, that in market visits, is it is it reasonable to expect that there's sort of dedicated dedicated time to your brand and your brand alone, or do you win a lot more points by saying, listen, I, I get you've got sort of a full bag of stuff. Let's let's go sell that, and when my brand fits, let's 
let's fit it in there because there's an under, there's an opportunity to understand what works and what plays yeah, in those account conversations. I, I, I would hope that if you're with a sales consultant and they have a your 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 product is a thirty dollar peanut noir uh, from Anderson Valley, they don't pull another. $30 Pinot Noir from the Anderson Valley app. I would hope that. Let's, that, that, that seems like a base of respect there. Um, so I think, I think there. But I do think, you know, let's say it's a spirit and wine rep and you're selling a wine and they have a whiskey. I, if I'm you, I'm jumping in on that sale. I'm going to help them. Hey, I see an opportunity. I'm going to help you with those features and benefits. And maybe at the end you could go, hey, I saw some opportunities of how to improve your sales pitch. I think that's a great way to have that camaraderie. Mm -hmm. Again, you own the space of that $50 Pinot Noir and, and you should expect to own that space. But you also have to understand they're out there selling some other things and help them. Um, you know, I think, um, I, I think I've seen more positive feedback from our salespeople on suppliers that are like that. Because our salespeople are a little nervous about that too. They're like, ooh, can I bring this other thing out? Um, so if you say, hey, what else are you working on this month? How can I help you? It's a great way to start a conversation. And again, to create that partnership because they have goals they have to hit as well. Again, that same principle does apply with media as well. They want to write about trends, and that often comes in the form of a new region. So, yeah. you know, if you're an emerging region and you think there's a story there that hasn't been told, get a few other suppliers as well that you can pitch a combined story because it's more rare to see a single producer feature. So instead, think about, oh, well, we really have a cool story here in the Anderson Valley. I'm going to get a few other producers and reach out to this journalist and give them a few different sources of information so that they actually have a real story and that I'm not just asking them to spit out my press release or my bio. Right. Just by, um, just by show of hands, how many of you all listening to this are saying, uh, yeah, I could probably do better on my market visits? Are you guys all knocking out of the ballpark? Are you feeling like, I got this? Show of hands. Is, every, is everybody feeling like, okay, there's some stuff, to, there's some stuff I could do differently here? Okay. All right, good. Um, so we'll keep we'll keep going with questions. I just want to make sure that this is this is helpful. I think it's really helpful. I'm learning stuff as I go through this. Um, okay, that's that's great. And I I'm glad to hear Jeff what just to sort of recap what you said, or and what all of you will hit, have hit on is all these questions in preparation are fair game, right? That that conversation requires the back and forth of understanding what their needs are and understanding what they're selling and where their problems are and getting to some agreement on, on what you're going to try to tackle um, from a media standpoint, from a, from a, um, a trade-in and retail or a, a trade-in distributor standpoint. Okay, good. All right. Um, all right. Um, I have a question for you, Juliana, that um, I'd, like to, I'd like to ask. We think about, um, a couple of people talked about blitzes, and granted, true blitzes uh, may not be necessarily always realistic, but hopefully, you know, you're having beyond just head of sales and marketing, um, owner, founder, winemaker going out. There's, there's probably opportunity for other members of your team to go out into market, but they're not necessarily always prepared to represent the brand um, mm -hmm. in the way that they need to. Um, with a with a retailer distributor or a media contact, do you have any tips on how to sort of easily succinctly get the internal team up to speed on sort of the key points that they need to to be talking to? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's helpful anytime you're taking an interview, or I guess this could apply to meeting with a uh, a buyer as well. But have a talking point sheet, develop, ask all those questions in advance. So create all the questions you think a journalist or a, um, a buyer might ask and prepare the answers and then have everyone on your team trained on what those answers are so everyone's speaking the same language so for example um, if a winemaker has a media interview and answers a question one way and then maybe a, a year later the owner or someone else from the brand team meets that same journalist that you're speaking the same lang language so I'd say have that that Q&A sheet prepared and have the whole team trained on that sheet I'd add though that media I'm sorry, I don't really want to speak with sales reps. They want to speak with winemakers and owners. It's really hard to ask a journalist to speak with a VP of sales because they don't want to talk about sales. They want to talk about the story of the winery. They want to talk about the winemaker. They want to talk about trends. So something I'd keep in mind with expectations, you know, think about you know, who you're presenting to a journalist as well and keep in mind what their goal is and that their goal is not sales related. It's actually a story. Right. So I would add that too. Um, Jim, I have a question for you. Thank you, Juliana. Um, how often would you like to get in to see, uh, to, to do a market visit in a particular market, and how often is realistic? 
Uh, I think it comes back earlier to uh, the concept of warm markets is uh, many of us have kind of 50 state envy and that's just a bad idea. You're gonna spread your time, your relationships and your money. So with regard to how often in the market, it, it could be, you know, you don't wanna say monthly, there was a really strong effort in the Florida to, to be in monthly. Um, and then also a distributor now, what's happening is there are so many brands that distributors may say you only get one, one day, one work with a quarter or, or whatever the case is. So I don't know what the right number is, I do think that you get a sense of when you're permeating the community. So would you have a drink with the local mixologist and have a happy hour like on a Monday when they might be off the floor and it looks fun? And then as you develop those relationships. But once again, I think that you'll get your own sense. Um, some time ago, uh, actually like 20 years ago, is that uh, another gentleman and I were trying to launch a brand in Vegas and we didn't know the market. So what we did actually is we actually went there for two straight weeks. And just, just think about it, ideally it's a city you like, but the key is is that you don't really kind of develop those relationships at your appointment, you develop those relationships at 10 p.m. at night. You develop those relationships by watching a Detroit Lions game at three o'clock if they invite you to your home. Don't think a market visit is really Monday through Friday at noon when you catch your flight out of town. It, we went there, we, we kind of moved there, we just got a hotel and stayed there, and that changed our entire relationship in the market. They knew so. better than to invite you to stay at their house. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My wife said I can't go back to Vegas either. <laughs> so just, 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 uh, just a couple things building on what you said. I think um, look, I, I spend a lot of time on the road. I'm, I'm, I get to be the first one on the plane, and Marriott greets me warmly. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm out a lot. Uh, but, but I think you know, if, I was in, if I were in your shoes, um, and you cover 35, 50 states, whatever it is, pick two. Pick two to go to regularly and start there. Um, there's zero reason for you to ever go to West Virginia. Zero. Zero. I'm sorry if you're from West Virginia. There's zero reason. Um, what a lot of big suppliers are doing now, they're saying, hey, I've got 25 states I care about, and I'm going to put one person in charge of the other 25. Think about a map right now, just the United States. There's probably 25 states that I drank more wine in my home in the past 10 years than they sell. Mm -hmm. particularly wine at a certain price point, right? So why go there? So if big suppliers are doing that, saying, hey, I'm going to divide the country in half and I'm going to have one of my people manage all 25 of these states, why are you going there? And again, there's probably two, five, seven states that you should ever go to. If you're a small business owner and you want to build a brand, and imagine if you took Jim's example and you went to, I don't know, Austin, Texas, and that's the only place you went for a year. Think you'd build some relationships? A lot of millennials there, a lot of trendsetters there. You think you'd start to build your brand out a little? Maybe. Um, probably better use of your time to develop true friendships in certain key hubs versus checking a box and saying, hey, I went to 60 places this year and I happen to spend time in, you know, West Virginia. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I, I can't help but mention this, this idea of focus and focusing on areas of strength and, um, and building upon those and sort of really zeroing in on those, those bullseyes within the U.S. Um, is ever, ever more critical. Um, I've, just, I've heard that, I'm surprised at how much I've heard that loud and clear throughout today, um, more so even than I thought. Um, as our last question, we only have a couple more minutes, but um, particularly with Julianne up here and, um, and Jeff with your and, and Jim's perspective, I want to go back to the prior discussion, sort of this idea of getting more than your fair share. And we talked a lot about programs. We sort of started off with this idea of incentives. Any other tool, you all were there, listen to it. But I love your all's voiceover on the tools and, and program, programmatic elements that go, gosh, these are really important. If you have a program period or focus period, really make sure that, yeah, these guys are spot on and, and these are the things that you really need. Anything that, that stood out or that you'd like to add to that conversation? Um, I think the idea of hitting your consumers directly is key, and you can do that through media or directly. And I think you know if we're all California wineries or domestic wineries here, right? So take your wine club on the road. So hit those consumers in those markets and you know have a dinner with them, go to one of their homes and set up a, a tasting. We talked about cake bread doing that. I think those small things do really add up. 
So try to bring in different elements, even on the media side, take interviews, but also go do a happy hour at an editorial office. They love that. Come bring them a few bottles of wine, let them relax at five o'clock at the end of the day. So think about different formats and experimenting with different things as well. Don't, don't be uh, afraid to try something different um, and maybe listen to your consultants and they suggest something a little outside the box and say, yeah, let's try it. You know what, what's the investment? It's the worst that could happen. Um, let's give it a shot. So differently, thinking creatively and thinking about how to touch each of your key audiences in different ways. Great. Anything else that you guys would add, Jim? Jeff? I like the question up there. It's pretty funny. <laughs> Which one? When is this over? Uh, no, it was, uh, what do I have against uh, John Denver wrote, what do I have against West Virginia? Let's answer that question. <laughs> I, I, I should have chosen some other states. Uh, Morgan's um, from John Denver, which is also very creative, very witty, very witty audience here. Um, I, you, you, you said other things, Dad. I, I, I kind of echo what the panel said before. I, I'm as anti-incentive as possible. Um, the planning meetings that I sit in, it, it drives me crazy when um, our, our when people get so excited on the supplier and distributor side about incentives. I mean, it's like, you didn't talk about the account targeting. No one got excited about that. But incentives, you want to get excited about because you want to craft this whole thing. And then we recap it. Nobody made any money. Nobody qualified. Um, it's a waste of time. It's an absolute waste of time. Invest your money in market visits. Invest your money in local media. Invest your money in activating the customer. That's that, or the, the consumer, sorry. Uh, that, that's where the opportunities are. I'd spend more of my time there. I'd do five more market visits and five less incentives. Great. Well, I want to give a um, warm round of applause to Jeff, Juliana, and Jim for their time.